Our next lesson in the book, lesson 7.6, has to do with a concept called linear programming. So we're going to introduce the idea today and give you a chance to work on some kind of basic problems dealing with linear programming. And then when we return from the break, um, we'll continue with this idea and kind of dig a little deeper into uh, using linear programming as a way to solve problems. So, a little bit about linear programming. Linear programming is simply a particular strategy for optimizing the value of a certain quantity in a business setting. Now, this idea of optimizing simply means that we want to find the maximum or minimum value for something in particular. So for example, we may want to maximize profit or we may want to minimize cost. So we would have an expression that would represent that profit or that cost and then finding the optimal value, optimizing that expression, would mean figuring out what gives you the maximum value if we're looking for something like profit or the minimum value if we're looking for something like um, cost. Okay, um, Linear programming problems usually consist of an objective function. So the objective function is that expression that we're trying to maximize or minimize. Something that represents cost, profit, um, revenue, anything like that. Okay, um, It is usually the objective of the problem. So we're talking about a business problem, and our objective, our goal, is to get the most profit, spend the least amount in costs, those kinds of things. Those, that objective function is going to be um, attainable within certain constraints. So constraints are going to be inequalities, they are going to be things that limit just how much you can make in profit or just um, how much cost there's going to be. Um, possible constraints might be things like labor, um, how much time you actually have in labor, or uh, materials, how many materials you actually have to work with to create something. Those kinds of things are the types of constraints you might have. And then when we graph all of the constraints and we look at the um, common set of solutions, the shaded area from all of the inequalities, then what we have is that feasible region we talked about last class, and within that we have feasible solutions. So anything in the shaded area, anything on a boundary line, those are all possible solutions to give us a value from the objective function and still stay within our constraints. Okay, And so this is what we need to keep in mind as we set up a linear programming problem. We're going to be setting up something that has an objective function. We're going to be um, looking at constraints and having to graph those constraints so that we can come up with what the feasible solutions are and ultimately find the optimal solution, the best solution for the problem. So an optimal solution of a linear programming problem, it ends up that if there is a possible solution, it always occurs at a vertex. So if you remember last class when we were talking about the vertices around a feasible region, okay, well here's where that becomes important. We need to be able to identify each vertex. We need to be able to come up with an ordered pair for each vertex because it's at one of those vertices that we will find a solution to our problem if one exists. Okay. Now, there may be more than one possible solution, but at least one of those possibilities is still going to happen at a vertex. So it's the vertices that are going to be very important to us. And that 
uh, solution that we come up with is going to be um, a unique value for our objective function. So when it comes to actually solving a linear programming problem, there's basically three steps. We need to sketch the region corresponding to the system of constraints. So again, remember constraints are going to be written as inequalities. So we're graphing a system of inequalities here. And again, just a reminder that all of the points inside or on the boundary are going to be feasible solutions to our particular problem. Then we need to find the actual vertices of the region. What are the ordered pairs of those corner points? And then we're going to test the objective function at each of the vertices and select the values of the variables that optimize the objective function. So we're going to test each of those ordered pairs at each of the corners. And then if we're trying to maximize the objective function, we're going to look for which vertex gives me the biggest number. If we're trying to minimize our objective function, then obviously we're looking for which one gives me the smallest number. If we have a bounded region, once we've graphed all of our constraints, then we know that it will be possible to find either a maximum or a minimum value. If we have an unbounded region, then we're going to have to look at what we've graphed to tell what's going to be possible. We may not be able to find both. All right, so let's do an example here quick. So it says here that we want to find the maximum value of this subject to these constraints. So this equation here, where we've got z equal to 3x plus 2y, this is what we would call our objective function. Now we don't know in this case what exactly our objective function represents. When we get into actual applications after break, this will actually represent a cost function or a profit function or something like that. For right now, we're just saying this is the objective function, and we are going to try to maximize that. And the constraints that we have to follow are here. So we know that whatever x represents and whatever y represents has to be positive numbers. That's what these two inequalities are telling us. We know that x plus 2 of y has to be less than or equal to 4. And we know that x minus y has to be less than or equal to 1. So we're going to start off by graphing that. So the first thing I know is that I need x values that are bigger than or equal to 0. So I'm going to be on this side of my y-axis. I also know that I need y values to be greater than or equal to 0. So I'm going to be on this side of my x-axis. I can also graph this inequality. Let's make that purple. So I'm going to, let's go by twos here. Two boxes should be good enough to make everything fit. All right, so um, because this is in standard form and because it's fairly easy to divide four by one and two, I'm going to find my x and y intercepts to graph this. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I put in 0 for y, then my x would be 4. So that's going to be out here. And if I put in 0 for x, then my y is going to be 2. So that's going to put me right there. And then I can graph. my line, since this is less than or equal to, it's going to be a solid line. And because I know that I'm going to be within these um, axes, I don't have to extend beyond the axes. Okay? So this is my x plus 2y greater than or equal to 4 boundary. Um, the side that would actually be shaded here, if I try 0, 0, 0 plus 0 is indeed less than or equal to 4, so I'm going to be shading on this side of the line. 
okay? And then my last inequality here is that x minus y is less than or equal to 1. So again, standard form, this would be pretty easy. I'm going to go with a, um, let's see, if we put in 0 for y, x is going to be 1. If I put in 0 for x, I actually need a negative 1, which isn't really quite on here. So instead, I'm going to come over here to 2. So if I choose 2 for x, then that means I would need a 1 for y in order to end up with 1 for my boundary. And again, this is a less than or equal to, so it'll be a solid line. And we'll draw something like that. If I choose 0, 0 as my point, again, 0 minus 0 is 0. That really is less than or equal to 1. So we're talking about things on this side. So my feasible region now ends up being this section right here. Based on my inequalities, this is where my feasible solutions are. Okay, so now I need to identify my vertices right here, right here, right here, and right here. Those are the corner points of my feasible region. Now those points that happen on the axes should be very easy to identify. This is obviously the point 0, 0. This is our point 0, 2. And this is going to be the point 1, 0. But what about this point? Now it looks like from graphing that this is the point 2, 1. But if I want to be really sure, I really need to be looking at what are the equations that gave me these two boundaries. So my green boundary, remember, is actually the equation x minus y equals 1. My purple boundary is actually the equation x plus 2y equals 4. So I at least need to check 2 comma 1 in both of those equations to make sure it works. If it doesn't, or if I can't tell because I'm in between grid lines, then I would take these two equations and I would solve them as a system of equations. Okay, so here 2 minus 1 would indeed be 1, that would work. Here 2 plus 2, 2 times 1, would give me 4, that would work. So this really is the point 2 comma 1. Okay, so that was step 2, finding the vertices. Step 3 now is to check out all of the points in our objective function. So I find it easiest to do this by kind of a um, table method. So my vertices are going to go in the first column. And so that's the point 0, 0. I have the point 0, 2. I have the point 1, 0 and I have the point 2 comma 1. Okay, um, And then we're going to have the objective function. But it's the objective function with the number substituted in. So z would equal 3 times my x value of 0 plus 2 times my y value of 0, which means I get 0. So my final result is 0. Here my z would be 3 times the x value of 0 plus 2 times the y value of 2. That's going to give me 4. In this case I would have z equal to 3 times the x value of 1 plus 2 times the y value of 0. That's going to give me a 3. And finally z equals 3 times the x value of 1 plus 2 times the y value of 1, sorry, x value of 2, so 3 times x value of 2, plus 2 times y value of 1, that's going to be 6 plus 2, so that gives me 8. 
And since we were looking to maximize our objective function, we're looking here at our results to see which one gives us the biggest answer. Okay, and so since it's the 2 comma 1 that gives us the largest result, our um, optimal solution here is the solution 2 comma 1. Okay, now just a quick look at why does this work? Why can I just test the corner points and one of those is going to be my solution? Well, if you think about this for a second, this is that objective function that we had. Okay, if I were to rewrite this objective function that looks very much like a standard form into slope intercept form, then I would end up taking z minus 3x, that would give me 2y, and then if I divide everything by 2, I end up with y equal to negative 3 halves x plus z over 2. So the negative 3 halves represents my slope, and this z over 2 represents my y-intercept. Now at the moment, not knowing z means I don't actually know what my y-intercept is. But no matter what my z value is, my slope is always going to be negative 3 halves. So what you're seeing over here is a series of different possible lines where they all have the same slope of negative 3 halves, but our y-intercept has changed for different z values. And so that's really what you're trying to find is what is the z value that is going to get me out here as far as I possibly can go and still be within this feasible region and in contact with feasible solutions. So as you move this line, as you slide it out for these different z values that give you different y-intercepts, you end up seeing how this particular vertex is the last possible point that this line touches. And so that's where the maximum value is going to be. If I was looking for the minimum value, then I would be moving the line this way until I get to the last possible point that I could touch, which would be 0, 0. So that's why this method works. When you set up an objective function like this, that objective function has a particular slope to it. And as you move your line across different possible z values, at some place, that line is going to hit one of those vertice points, those vertex points, as the last possible feasible solution that there could be before it's completely out of range. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at one more example here. So here we're being asked to both maximize and minimize the value of our objective function, which is z equals 4x plus 2y. And again, we're given our constraints. So again, we are keeping x values greater than or equal to 0 and we are keeping y values greater than or equal to zero. And that's pretty common in application um, business kinds of problems. X and Y usually represent number of units being produced or something like that. So you're obviously not going to have a negative number of units. So we're usually going to be graphing just in the first quadrant. Okay. Then we've got X plus 2Y being greater than or equal to 4 this time. So if I again, let's see, could we go with, I think we can still go with uh, every two boxes here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Let's see if that works. All right, so 
Again, if we put in 0 for y, x is going to be 4. Put in 0 for x, y is going to be 2. Okay, so one of our boundary lines is again going to be from the 2 to the 4. But now notice this time that we are greater than or equal to 4. So we're actually talking about shading that should happen on this side of the line. Okay, then if we go to the next one, um, this one doesn't divide so nicely. So if we think of this as being y greater than or equal to negative 3x plus 7, so that means we'd actually need a 7 up here. That actually works. That's way up here. And then we need a negative 3 for our slope. Now since I have the same slope on both x and y axes, I can just count boxes for my slope. Oh, wait a second. Little problem here. This is actually 4. <laughs> I miscounted which makes this 5, and that is actually 6. Sorry about that. It's my mistake. All right, so let's just actually put in some points here. If I put in 1 for x, then that would be a negative 3 here plus the 7. That's going to give me a 4 for y. So let's correct that. We'll use this point and not this point. If I put in 2 for x, then I'd have a negative 6 plus 7, which would give me positive 1. And so now I've got the two um, points that I need to be able to draw a boundary here. Okay. And again, we want this to be greater than or equal to, so we're talking about being on this side of the red line. All right, finally, we're looking at negative x plus 2y being less than or equal to 7. So again, if we change this into slope-intercept form, since the division isn't so nice, we'd be looking at 2y less than or equal to x plus 7, which means y would be less than or equal to 1 half x plus 7 halves. 7 halves is 3 and a half, so that's going to be right here for a y-intercept. And then 1 half is going to be up 1 over 2. Up 1 over 2. Do that a couple of times. Draw our boundary line. And this time we're talking about y being less than or equal to, so we're on this side of the line. So what we end up with now for our region is going to be this region right in here. Okay, this is our feasible region. This is where our feasible solutions are going to be. Now if we go back to our objective function, when we're being asked to maximize, if you imagine some line with some slope being moved along to try to find a maximum value, can you see what the issue is going to be? The fact that we ended up with an unbounded feasible region means there's a good chance that we're never going to find a maximum value because this section just can just keep going and going and going. And so regardless of what that slope would be, there's never going to be a point where I hit the very last possible point in the feasible solutions. So I'm not going to be able to find a maximum. In this case, because of the unbounded region. But what about minimum? So again, if we're talking about sliding a line with some verte or some slope to it, but this time sliding it back down this way to find the very last point we would possibly touch, that's going to be possible. It's possible it could be this point or this point or this point. That works. 
So that's what we're going to set up in our table. We'll have our ordered pair for the vertices. So where are those vertices at? This appears to be at 1, 4. We actually know that's at 1, 4 because that was one of the points we used in our red line. And so 1, 4 is there. This appears to be 2, 1. And that's using the red and the green lines. So if we came and substituted 2 and 1 into both of those, we would find that that works. And, of course, this one is the point 4, 0. And those are the only three vertices that we have on the shaded region. We're not going to use these y-intercepts because they're not in contact with the feasible region. So we're looking at 1, 4, 2, 1, and 4, 0. Okay? Put those into the objective function and get our results. All right, so our objective function, z equals 4 times x, which is 1, plus 2 times y, which is 4. That's going to be 4 plus 8. That's going to give us 12. z equals 4 times 2 for x, plus 2 times 1. That's going to be 8 plus 2. That's going to give us a 10. And finally, 4 equals 4 times 4 plus 2 times 0, that's going to give us a 16. And so our winner here is going to be the 10. And so for a minimum, that's going to occur at the point 2, comma 1. So no maximum is possible with this kind of problem but we can still find the minimum and it occurs at 2 comma 1. So you have to be careful with unbounded regions, but when you have bounded regions, either is possible. All right, that should be enough to get you going on the first few problems that are assigned on Canvas. Um, if you have any questions, we'll deal with them when we get back and we'll dig into some actual application problems at that time. Uh, if I don't see you before Friday, have a great break. We'll see you when you get back.